Good evening, Credit Grace. We have a small verse for you which says, which is in Romans 6 11. It says, So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the first song says, All because of Jesus I am alive. So sing with us. Christ and cover 
Yes, Father, Lord. My life, Father, to you, Father. My strength, Father, to you, Lord. You are precious, Father, Lord. You have given us everything, Lord. You have given your love to us, Father. We really thank you for all the things that you have been doing in our lives, Father. In this rest of the time that you have us, Father, you bless us, Father.
am not skilled to understand What God has will, what God has planned I only know what is right and Stands one to raise my Savior I take him at his word and be Christ died to save me, this I read. And in my heart I find a need of him to be my Savior. That he will leave his place on high and come for sinful man to die. Hi, and uh, this is once again for Sunday evening service and um, another classic message by Pastor Carl and as we uh, remember him, his legacy, uh, one of the best ways I thought was to just go through a few of his messages and remind ourselves that we have been well led, we have been well taught. Uh, this message, His Mercy Endures Forever, is one of his classic messages and in which we know this principle about God's mercy, but the way he brings it out is uh, amazing. And I, I know that this portion will bless you and really encourage you. And I, so I, I request you to pay close attention to the message and enjoy and be encouraged and edified. And, uh, you know, in these days to come, remember the faithfulness of God and also remember that his mercy endures forever. Never give up hope because we have Christ in our lives and uh, this is the way uh, we want to move forward by remembering what God has done and no matter what happens in our life his mercy endures forever so enjoy the message have a great time and uh, you know God bless did I preach such strong messages <laughs> you know get back at pastor <laughs> okay all right let's let's turn let's stand Second Chronicles chapter 20. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're not going to do uh, Acts just today. We'll start again next week. Uh, 
felt like we should celebrate this new home. <clears throat> My voice is also gone, by the way. So if I croak in between, just give me grace. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. I don't know how many churches have so much fun, but I sure love serving the Lord. This is amazing. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. And you may be familiar with the story, and if it's not, I will explain it as well. And it came about that after this, the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, that were enemies of the nation of Israel, together with some of the Munites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah, the fourth king after Solomon, and he was a very godly king. And then some people came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hassan Tamer. And Jehoshaphat was, did what was normal. He was, a, he was a believer, he loved the Lord, and he found out that he was in trouble because there was going to be enemies from every side. Has that happened to you? Do you have some enemies from every side? Sometimes we do. I mean, situations that come, and unsafe situations, and people around us. And we may find ourselves in a place like this. Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. Okay, and that's a good place to be because God will take us out of our problems. He will take us out of our problems, but he might want to teach us something in our problems. So Jehoshaphat was afraid and he turned his attention to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. They went to prayer. And uh, verse 13, all Judah was standing before the Lord with the infants, their wives and the children, like that. Everybody came out to church. Everybody came out to church. You bring your wives, you bring your children, and if you're like Narendra, you bring your infants. <laughs> okay, and we love that. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, and he said, in verse 15, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid or be dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but it's God's. What a great verse. The battle you're facing is not yours if you're a true believer in Christ, but it's God's. God's going to be responsible for your victory. If you follow Him, He will take you out. And that's the whole story, okay? Ah, in verse 17, you need not fight in this battle. Station yourself, stand, and you will see the salvation of the Lord in your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be fearful or dismayed, for tomorrow go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat heard this, and he bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Sometimes the Lord's solutions seem so foolish. Like we just think, oh Lord, I mean, just go to church and praise Him and love Him and follow the Word. And you're going to take me out of this whole battle that I'm in? And the Lord says, yes. And you just humble yourself and bow your face to the ground and say, Lord, yes, and I will do it for you. And you know what He does? Jehoshaphat bowed his head and fell down and worshipped the Lord. The Levites, the sons of Kohath, stood up to praise the Lord God with a loud voice. They rose early in the morning and they went out of the wilderness. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah. Put your trust in the Lord your God and you will be established. Put your trust in His prophets, His messengers, and you will succeed. And when he had consulted with the people, they appointed those who sang to the Lord Yahweh and those who praised him in holy clothing. And they went out before the army. They went out before the army. And they said, and notice what they said. They sang a song. Give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness or his mercy is everlasting. His mercy endures forever. This was a song they sang. Do you know that in the Old Testament, if you read the Psalms, and you read the Bible, this same similar words were used. His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. It's used over 46 times 
in the Old Testament. And it's sung often. God, your, your good and your mercy endures forever. The word actually, the Hebrew means your mercy conquers everything. Nothing can stop your mercy towards me, God. And I acknowledge that. Okay, got it? What is mercy? Let's think about this before we go into the message. What is mercy? How is mercy different from grace? Mercy is when God forgives me my sins. You sinned, you failed, you made mistakes, and God says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. Did you hear what I said? I'm not going to give you what you deserve. You say, God, what kind of God are you? <clears throat> what kind of God are you? Every other gods of the world give people what they deserve. Punishment, justice. But I am Yahweh and I give you what you don't, what you, I don't give you, I don't give you what you deserve. I will forgive you your sins. I will give you mercy. And then, graces, on top of that, I will give you what you didn't deserve. This is what God did. He forgave us our sins and made us believers. But He didn't stop there. He made us kings and priests with Him. How would you take a criminal and you pardon him? That's mercy. But when you make him a king and priest and a royal member of your household, that's grace. You understand the difference? When God saved me, that was mercy. Because He saved me. But when He seated me in the heavenly positions with Him, so that forever and ever I'm going to be a trophy of grace, that's grace. But God says, my mercy will never stop. My mercy will endure forever. And this was the song they sang. Now let's see what happened. When they began singing and praising. And when they began, oh, how nice. When they began singing and praising the Lord. The Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Who had come against Judah, so they were routed. In Judah, verse 24, came to the lookout of the wilderness. They looked to the multitudes, and behold, there were corpses lying on the ground, and no one had escaped. And in verse 26, they called the valley, the valley of Baraka, which means the valley of blessing. <coughs> Beautiful thought. Let's turn back to the same book, to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Another great portion of scripture. <clears throat> In chapter 5, verse 1, then all the work, that's all the work that Solomon performed for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things. This is Solomon has built a beautiful temple. Solomon's temple was world famous. And they brought the utensils in and they dedicated the temple. And in verse 11 it says. And when the priests came forth from the holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves. And all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Haman, Jedutin, and his sons and kinsmen, who were clothed in fine linen with cymbals and harps and lyres, standing east of the altar, with a hundred and twenty priests, blew trumpets in unison. And when the trumpeters and singers would have made themselves heard with one voice to praise and glory the Lord, Glorify the Lord. And when they lifted up their voices, accompanied by the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music, and when they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good, and His loving kindness or His mercy endures forever, then the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. The cloud of God's glory came down, and the priests themselves could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We have an expectation this morning to hear from You. I will preach, Lord, and I pray You'd anoint our words that You speak into the hearts of each one here that's gathered to listen, Lord. For we've come to hear from You. And we thank You. So bless our morning together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want you to consider this. Psalm, David said in Psalm 22, 
in verse 3, Psalm 22 in verse 3, David said, For the Lord God inhabits the praises of His people. I want you to think about that. The Lord God inhabits the praises of His people. What does it mean? In the Hebrew, it means that when we begin to praise the Lord, God is enthroned on our praises. It means that God manifests Himself in a very powerful, powerful way when His people begin to praise Him. Now please understand, God is always present with us. As a New Testament believer, the Holy Spirit lives in us permanently. and We don't have to call the Holy Spirit down. That's absolutely unbiblical teaching. That happened at the day of Pentecost. And ever since that day, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. But when you begin to praise the Lord, the Lord does manifest Himself in a powerful way. He begins to. We see this all through the New Testament too. When Paul and Barnabas prayed, praise the Lord in the prison, God did something powerful. He manifested His presence in that prison. Now think about this. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. Solomon is dedicating his temple. It's, it's taken seven years to build the temple. 70,000 people, workers, have worked in the temple. Uh, after it's all over and so beautiful, Solomon gets all the elders together. Then they get all the utensils, the holy vessels and the, into, the, into the temple. They get everything. Uh, and they bring it all to the house of God. And then Solomon sacrifices. The Bible says they sacrifice thousands and thousands of sheep and lambs because of the great day of the dedication of the temple. And then when it's all over, imagine all this effort, all the set up crew, all the sacrifices. They were setting up the hall and they, sac they were sacrificing. And then I like what happens. They begin to praise the Lord. Solomon says, come on, praisers. Come on, musicians. Let's praise the Lord. Let's make a joyful sound. Let's praise Him from our hearts. And there was all these people 120 trumpeters blowing trumpets and there was the Levitical priest that David had trained. Remember, David trained the singers to sing. He had a 700 uh, choir that, that David had in the temple. The temple was supposed to be one of the most beautiful places. And David personally trained the temple choir people and uh, he had gatekeepers to make sure there was no disturbance, just like we do. No, don't get angry at the ushers. They are, they are friends. Okay, so all these beautiful things. And when they were all praising the Lord, and when they sang with one voice in unison, and said, the Lord, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. The Lord began to hear this amazing unity among the people as they praised Him. And you know what? The Lord responded as He always responds to praises. And the Lord showed him. It wasn't the wisdom the setup that brought the glory down. It wasn't the sacrifices that brought the glory down. It was the praise of God that brought the glory down. And the glory of the Lord came down upon the whole house. And it was an Old Testament kind of Pentecost. You know what I mean? In a sense, it wasn't over everybody. It was in the Holy of Holies, the, the glory of God. They could, they could see the cloud of God. And the priest began... The priests that were ministering could not minister anymore. Imagine, imagine if, if the Lord does it and He is. We don't see glory, glory, clouds. And, uh, but I, I want to see you. And, uh, but uh, we, we do sense the glory of God come and minister to us. And what a beautiful day that must have been. They worshipped and they, were, they did all, this, all of that. But then the glory of God came in. And when the glory of God came in, there was no chance to minister anymore. They could not minister because God Himself was ministering to them. Are you listening to me? What a beautiful thing. And I, I like to think about it. Before they were working very hard to do all the preparations. But when the glory of God came in, there was no need to do that. They could rejoice and relax in the presence of God. What an awesome thought. Now what, a, what an amazing thing. And over and over again, the scriptures were told, praise the Lord. And Right? David says in Psalm 149, if you turn there for just a moment, he says, I want you. Think about this. The Lord says over and over again to us, praise me. Why would the Lord say that? Praise me. Doesn't it sound funny? Like if somebody told you, praise me, you'd say you're crazy. How can I praise you? But when the Lord says, the Lord inspires David to write, praise the Lord, the Lord is telling us to do something that is very, very meaningful. 
because God knows that He is the supremest, the most beautiful treasure in the whole universe. And it's just like when you see a sunset, you want to praise this, say, thank you, wonderful sunset. The same, when you really see God, you just want to say, God, you're majestic, you're awesome. There's no words to describe you. And in asking us to release our praise and exclamation and admiration for God, God is actually blessing us. He's actually allowing us to shout His praise because that's why we were created to praise the Lord. You understand? There was a famous singer, her name was a Swedish singer called Anne Lind in the 1950s. And she, she many of you might even heard her name. She was a pop singer, very famous. And one day she came to know Jesus Christ and she gave up all the pop singing and uh, rocky music. And she just found herself singing, going to concerts and singing in churches. And one day the BBC interviewed her and said, Anne, why are you singing? Why aren't you? Why didn't you slip out in the, of the limelight of the world stage? And why are you now just singing in churches? And she said, because I needed to be alone with God. Because all my fame and everything that I did on the stage of the world, he said, it kept me. And she was sitting in a park. She said, it kept me from this. And she pointed to creation. She said, it kept me from this, and she said, it kept me from this, the Word of God that she had in her hand. And she said, oh, I, I, I couldn't trade it for anything in the world, and what a beautiful thing. And then David says the same thing, and this morning, I want to teach you, I want to teach you. We might do a few sessions on really learning to worship. I want you to come to church. I want you to learn. We will do a, a book of Acts, but every... Five times in the book of Acts, we'll just go into our time of worship. Because we need to learn. We always need to learn how to worship the Lord and why we worship the Lord. And you need to come in early. Come in as, as, much, as early as you can. No condemnation if you get stuck at home. But try to come in early because the praise and worship is beautiful and it's so beautiful. Uh, in Psalm 149, David says, listen to how David says, read the whole Psalms and you'll see. He says, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. In verse 4 he says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. And he will beautify the, those who are going through trials with his deliverances. He will beautify the afflicted with his salvation. And the word salvation also means deliverances in its context. So I will beautify those who go through trials as they praise me, I will beautify them in this salvation. Let them sing. Let the godly ones exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. And you know, when you're really following God, and you really have the Word of God before you, you sing everywhere. Some of you sing. I know bathroom singers, but there's also singers in the bed. You sing, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how your voice sounds. You're just happy. You're serving the Lord. And it's a beautiful thing. Let them sing the high praises of God in their mouth. You know, there's different kinds of emotions. Have you ever sung low praises? You go to church and you're going through something and you're occupied when you say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you know. Praise the Lord. I mean, you can't even lift your hand. But then we sing the high praises of God, which is, God, thank you that no matter what's going on in my life, I will praise you. I learn to sing in a high key in terms of spirituality. And I praise the Lord. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. You know, you understand what I'm talking about? Let the high praises of God be on their mouth. And I like this. It says, uh, uh, and, and, and the high praises be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Uh, in Psalm 50, praise the Lord in His sanctuary. Praise the Lord in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. I love getting up every morning and just spending time worshiping and praising the Lord. I have so much, and you have so much to praise Him. Now I'm going to give you a couple of things, and we, we, we want to share a few things about the alphabet of praise. And I was thinking about this. Number one, let me, let me give you a few reasons why we praise God. And I, I'm going to share with you a little bit about the A reason why we praise God, okay? The A reason. Ready? We praise God because praise applauds all that God has done. Let's give some reasons why we praise the Lord. Praise applauds all that God has done. Let's say it together. Praise what? Applauds all that God has done. Let's remember the psalm. It says in Psalm 66 verse 1 and 2, Shout joyfully to the Lord, David said, with a voice of victory. Clap your hands, all you people 
applaud what God has done for you. Wow, applaud Him. Why are we praising God? Because the Bible says we were created, Revelation 4.11 says, we were created to praise Him. But applaud what He's done. Let me, let me turn with me to Romans chapter, eight, or Romans chapter 1 very quickly. And I'm going to read something to you and show you what happens when we really don't know to praise the Lord. Let me tell you what happens. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. It says, it says in, uh, it's talking about the unsaved. And what happens to an unsaved person when they don't learn to give God gratitude? And this is what it says. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. This is the sinner, the person who's unsaved. And unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident in them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, attributes are something that is something that's true of God that never changes. His eternal power and His divine nature, having been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. But listen to verse 21. But the unsaved people, even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. How sad. People often ask me, why is it that some people get saved? Why is it that some are drawn from all backgrounds? We have people from all backgrounds in this room. Why were some people drawn to Christ? Because when God gives you creation, and you say, thank you God, thank you for the sun and the moon and the stars, thank you for food at my table, thank you God, and you bless His name, and you really mean it with your heart, you give thanks to the Lord, God draws you, and He then speaks to your heart and gives you more revelation. In His light we see more light. But a person who says, Lord, I see you, but I don't care about you. I don't really care about you. That person actually is turning, instead of turning what the light he's received into praise, that person is actually rejecting God, in a sense. And even though they knew God, they did not give thanks to God. Ingratitude is a problem, is the root of all sins. And because they, they rejected God and never praised the Lord, you know what? God says, okay, listen to what happened because they did. Verse 21. They became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was heart darkened. So, because they didn't praise the living God, they became darkened in their understanding. And then they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That's why they began to worship uh, man, and they worship animals, and worship snakes, and they worship rats. And don't we know about that? Wow. But it all started with not giving thanks to God. You see, when you are really spirit-filled, and you are a believer, and you praise the Lord, the Bible says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, giving thanks, praise to the Lord. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you won't be operating in your flesh. When you praise the Lord, you receive revelation. Your heart is prepared, and what a beautiful thing. And you are saying to God, God, I applaud everything you've done for me. I look at your creation and I applaud it, Lord. I applaud it. That's a great reason to praise the Lord. Amen? What a beautiful thing. Anne Lynn found that out. And never make, a, make an excuse for coming to church and appreciating and applauding all that God has done for you. The second thing is the letter B. Applaud, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Listen to this one. My wife once asked me, what does it say? Why does it say, bless the Lord? We were just talking, and we thought about it for a few minutes. Like, why am I blessing the Lord, right? What is, why does the psalmist say, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless the Lord? Why does he say that? Psalm 103, bless the Lord. 
Psalm 104, bless the Lord. Psalm 134, bless the Lord. All His servants of the Lord who serve Him day and night in His temple. Bless the Lord. And I thought about this. Because God wants us to bless Him by recognizing who He is and thanking Him for who He is. He says, bless the Lord and never forget one of His benefits. Don't forget it. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. It's a beautiful thing. Many times people come to church and they, they, say, they say words like this. I came to church and the worship was beautiful. Today the worship was excellent. I got a lot out of it. And I want to remind you that may be a good thing to say. But really, can I say something? Worship was not for your benefit alone. Worship was not about you. Worship was about giving glory to God and blessing Him. Amen? And if you come to church and you just say, I got a lot about it. Oh, I didn't get anything out of it today. Or maybe it was a little bit distracting. But what did you do today? Did you bless the Lord? That's what God wants to do. When I bless the Lord, I, I receive something beautiful in my heart. God says, yes, you're blessing me. The third C, the C of praise. Listen to this. Praise changes me. And praise cleanses me. You know, we know what happens when you praise the Lord. Let me tell you what happens when you praise the Lord. Number one, when Isaiah was praising the Lord, have you ever had a hard week? Have you had a week where situations came in in your life and you just came to church and you were like feeling condemned because you didn't do well? Maybe you and your wife had a disagreement last night and you said, why should I go to church? I don't want to feel like a hypocrite. Like, who are you anyway? Right? You know what I mean? We all fail and fall. And you just think, wow, you know, can I go to church? Can I, can I just worship the Lord today? You know what the Lord, I love this that happens. When you go to church, the Lord speaks to you and He ministers to you. And if you keep going to church as a family, and you bring your wife and you bring your family and you go to church, you know what? You get counseled through the Word of God. And I promise you, you'll have the strongest marriage and the strongest family because you're just going to church because they came with women and children. All of them came to praise the Lord. You understand that? And oftentimes when we're praising the Lord, I know this in my own life, like Isaiah, we're praising the Lord and we're worshiping Him. And Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and His throne, His glory filled the temple. The Lord was in His throne, remember? And He saw the angels, and Isaiah had a vision of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. And the angels were shouting before the throne of God, seraphim angels, holy, holy, holy Lord. And they just, day and night, they're just shouting. And Isaiah has this vision of Jesus on the throne. And as he's, as he's worth looking at this beautiful worship time and partaking of it, he says, Oh Lord, woe is me, for I am undone. And it didn't make a difference. Just woe is me. That's all he said. Lord, I am a man of unclean lips among, among unclean people. And the Lord was so beautiful. The Lord is a finished word God. He did it on the basis of cro the Calvary's cross that was coming. The Lord took burning coals from the altar of the brazen altar that spoke of the cross. And he took it and he touched Isaiah on the lips and said, Your sin is taken away from you. Worship me now. And this is what happens in church when we are worshiping the Lord. You understand? You go to church and you say, Oh Lord, I'm doing okay. Or oh, maybe, Lord, I'm not doing so good. But I go to church and the Lord touches me and I'm cleansed and I'm renewed and I'm refreshed. And I can go out and I can serve Him and I, I have no condemnation. Or oh, maybe you think you're doing well. And then as you're worshiping and, and the worship leader and the team is worshiping and bringing you before the throne of God so beautifully and so powerfully uh, that you are in... in just in God's presence. And you know what? Suddenly the Holy Spirit brings to your heart little attitudes you had through the week. Little, little things that you could have missed. Little things. Little things. And you say, oh Lord, yes. And the Holy Spirit touches you. And you are changed. You are changed in those areas of your life. And you just because you honored the Lord by going to church and being a part of the praise. What a beautiful thing. He changes me. He cleanses me. Oh, I like this. The Bible says very clearly, Rejoice in the Lord uh, in all things, at all times rejoice. And then it says, Do not be anxious for anything, but in all things make your need known to God. And the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And prayer is very beautiful, but notice, Rejoice in the Lord before you pray. In other words, praise preceded prayer. 
And so often in our lives, when we're praising Him and thanking Him for all that He's done, the Lord just kind of like so beautifully in the praise service, I feel like the stress is gone. When I, I came with a lot of stress, but the Lord spoke to me and He took the stress away. I was like a balloon. I was filled with stress. And Craig began worshiping. And he sang, Arise, O God. And he sang, The Lord reigns in the heavens. And all of a sudden, it was like the balloon was being just, little air was being run out. Let out, let out. And I went out of church like happy. Just very happy. Because God was speaking to me. And that's what the praise does. And it's so beautiful. Point number D. D. Praise defeats the devil. I like it. Come on, say it. Praise defeats the devil. Praise what? defeats the devil. I applaud. I bless the Lord. He changes me. He cleanses me. But praise defeats the devil. Do you remember? Let me tell you a story. Yeah, let me tell you a story. Remember King Saul? Man, he was in trouble, King Saul. Because he disobeyed God. And he was very presumptuous. And he didn't sacrifice the, the sheep, the camp, King Agag, and the whole story. And presumptuous and so disobedience 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 and so the Lord did if you didn't listen to this message on last Wednesday it was awesome the Lord used an evil spirit not to possess him because no believer can be possessed by an evil spirit but sometimes God uses the devil to correct his own saints are you listening the devil is still God's tool God doesn't use it often so don't be over concerned about it don't get devil occupied. Okay? Just a small little correction for King Saul. So the Lord allows an evil spirit. The Lord allowed. Read it carefully. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. And the Lord sent an evil spirit to terrorize Saul. He was already disobedient, already carnal, not obeying the Lord. And so this evil spirit comes from the outside. And he begins to play with his mind. Saul doesn't know what is happening. And he begins to terrorize him and harass him. He put thoughts in his mind and harass him and harass him and harass him. And Saul can't sleep. And Saul can't eat properly. And Saul is very discouraged. And Saul is very depressed. He doesn't know why. And somebody says one day, there's a great guy, a young youth. He goes to youth ministry in Great Grace Church. And he plays, he plays the harp amazingly. And he's, he loves the Lord. And we heard him, and he's such an anointed musician. You should go and get him in your court and praise him. And David comes along. You remember what happens? David begins to sing. This is long before David is a king. David is not in the, a king. He's employed in the courts of Saul to be the music musician. And he's leading praise and worship in the courts of Saul. And this young 16, 17 year old is praying the harp and singing his songs to God. And it says when, when he was singing the songs to God, it says the Spirit of God was there. And, and, and Saul was being refreshed. And as soon as he began praising the Lord, what did the evil spirit do? What did the demon do? The demon went away. The demon went away. I like that. Don't you? The demon went away. And what does that mean? I like to think about this. When I praise the Lord, can I, can I say this? When you praise the Lord, the enemy has to flee. You know why? Because when we start really getting it up and really just praising the Lord and from our hearts and worshiping in our homes and the enemy is trying to trouble you and trying to discourage you and you just take the psalms and the hymns and you play some music and you worship the Lord, the, the spirit goes. I like I love saying Satan is allergic to prayer, to praise. He hates praise. He doesn't like to be around people that are happy. He doesn't like to be people that have the word of God filling them. Be filled with the Word of God, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Be filled with the Spirit, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. You know why? Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.18 mean the same thing. To be filled with the Spirit means to be filled with the Word of God. If you're filled with the Word of God, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Many people don't get it correct. They think jumping, dancing, doing this, all that is, is being filled with the Spirit. But if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be filled with the Word of God. And you'll have peace in your heart. And the Holy Spirit will direct you and guide you in every area of your life. What a beautiful thing that is. So, I like that. Number E, praise, enlist the angels to help us. What a beautiful thing. I like it. When, do you remember when, when Saul and Paul and Silas were in the prison? And they were 
there and in the Philippine jail, and Saul and Silas all beaten up began to sing their songs and hymns in the night at midnight to the Lord. And it says, suddenly there was an earthquake. Now think about this for a moment. When the angel moved the stone from Jesus' tomb, there was an earthquake. Because the angel came. Notice the words it says in Matthew 28. It says, the angel of the Lord descended on a stone, and then there was an earthquake. And I really believe the angel caused the localized earthquake. You understand what I mean? Okay? And when the angel came down, man, he must have been a heavy angel. But he caused that earthquake. And I really believe that when they were singing songs, God had an angelic intervention. Because how do you explain the fact that the earthquake came and their bonds, just their bonds were removed, and the chains were removed, and the gates are opened up? God could do it supernaturally, but I really believe it. It says, the angel of the Lord in Psalm 34, 7, encamps around those who fear Him. He encamps around those who fear Him. And when they were praising the Lord, the angels came, and I love it, they gave a deliverance. And here we have it again in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat doesn't know what to do. And you don't know what to do. But the Lord said to Jehoshaphat through a man of God, He says, just... Just praise me. Just the battle is the Lord's. I don't don't look at your problem. Don't look at your situations. But the Lord is good, and His the battle is His. Stand still, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. And and Joseph had consulted with the people, and they they just can you have you ever seen an army like this? Have you ever seen the weirdest battle ever fought? The the most crazy battle ever fought. They're going to battle, and which which group except Israel will send the army with musicians ahead? playing guitars like a praise march you know just going out ahead just going out and they're playing guitars and playing the lyre and the harp and they're, they're shouting the Lord is good the Lord is good his mercy endures forever and they don't have to fight they don't have to do anything just praising the Lord and the Lord sends ambushes and he and the Lord sends angels probably and and the, the army is routed and that is an amazing thing and the Lord wants us to know that that many times in our lives we don't know how what the solution should be. But we carry on in praise. Haven't you seen that in your life? And I have too. And I like it. And E is that. And F is be focused and fervent and praising Him. And G is bring glory to Him. But let me just bring one more thing very quickly. And close it because I don't want to make it a long message. Listen to what they sang. It's so beautiful. They sang... His mercy endures forever. Oh, I wonder how. And every time they sang, His mercy endures forever. At the temple dedication, they sang, His mercy endures forever. Remember in 1 Chronicles chapter, uh, chapter 16, and 40, verse 41, it says, David went to get, remember the Philistines had the Ark, they took the Ark of the Covenant, if you don't just read the story, you'll hear. and they took the Ark of the Covenant, and the Philistines took it to Gaza, and it cursed the Philistines, because the Ark of the Covenant could only bless the believers, and then uh, David goes and gets the Ark back, and then David is so happy to have the Ark back, that he's dancing around the Ark, remember? And his wife says, ah, look at that, look at the king, the king is making a fool of himself. And he's praising the Lord. And David said, no, no, no. This is a happy time. We should praise the Lord because the Lord is good. And he said, listen, His mercy endures forever. In Ezra chapter 3, when the Jews came back from Babylon, and they were in Babylon, and they came back, and Zerubbabel built the temple. When they put the foundation stone of the temple, you know what they said again? His mercy endures forever. In other words, the foundation of our lives is the mercy of God. In Psalm 103, His mercy endures forever. In Psalm 136, what, 26 times in the psalm, the psalmist says, His mercy endures forever. He crossed the Red Sea. He took us through the Red Sea. His mercy endures forever. They give manna from heaven. His mercy endures forever. He helped us to build the temple. His mercy endures forever. He created the heavens and the earth. His mercy endures forever. He leads us through the light. His mercy endures forever. Why is the psalmist saying that? His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. Because the point is, when God gives us His mercy, His mercy is unconquerable. His mercy will stop at nothing. I don't care how far you've been. I don't care how where you've been. His mercy will reach you. Even if you sin, God's mercy will go beyond your sin. 
and He will save you because that's what Jesus came to do. Your mercy, your sin can never outrun the mercy of God. Because the Bible says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And don't you ever feel that I will be such a failure in my life that nobody can save me and nobody can change me. No, I want to tell you this. Every one of us has the same problems. Every one of us can fail many times in a day. But if it wasn't for God's mercy, we wouldn't be here. His mercy never fails. And His mercy always never is outlasted. And what a beautiful thing. His mercy is forever. Did you know this? Listen carefully because it's so beautiful. When the Jews would meet each other on the streets in Israel, even now, you know what the word they use to say? They say, Shalom. Shalom. You know, many Jews are looking for Shalom. <laughs> they heard she sings really good. She does good PowerPoint presentations. So they're all going, Shalom, Shalom. So we've hit Shalom very carefully in the office. They say, Shalom, which means what? Peace. But when Paul wrote his epistles, he doesn't say just peace. He starts his epistles with grace and peace. You know why? You can't have peace unless you have the grace of Jesus Christ. Only when you've accepted Christ as your Savior and you've believed in Him through grace to faith, then you can have real peace in your life. Whenever Paul wrote Colossians, listen to this, listen to this, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he starts with grace and peace be to you, believers in Jesus Christ. When he writes Colossians, when he writes Ephesians, when he writes Philippians, when he writes uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, all these epistles, he always starts with grace and peace. But surprisingly, when he writes 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, they're written to pastors. And he writes, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. In other words, he knew oh, pal, these pastors need more mercy. You understand? He knew. He knew that we needed his mercy. When he writes 2 Timothy, he says, grace, mercy, and peace be to you, pastors in that sense but his mercy is beautiful Jeremiah said his mercies are new every single morning Lamentations 3 22 23 his mercies are new every morning and great is his faithfulness oh I like to think about it. I was often thinking why is his mercies new only in the morning because we need it in the morning more than ever you see by the end of the day we've all been impatient we've all been a little irritable we all came back and we need his mercy and we go to bed oh lord forgive me oh lord did you do that come on don't be such a don't be such a saint don't be i mean you are a saint but don't be so holy come on we all need it don't we the little things we said the little thoughts we thought that may not have been reflected in him we say oh god Oh God, I want to live for you more. I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I did that. Would you forgive me? And immediately His mercy comes. He cleanses me and He washes me. And He says, I give you my mercy. What a beautiful thing. We wake up in the morning and we say, Oh yeah, yesterday was yesterday. But today His mercy is anew. And if you pray that in the night, then His mercy is anew in the evening too they are his mercies are new every morning I like to think about in my life in your life every morning when you wake up think about it imagine the postman coming and he comes to your door and he says here's a suitcase for you you say what's in it he says it's come from God it's new mercies every day for you pick up the suitcase open it and see what he has for you today he has mercy for your job he has mercy for your business when you wake up in the morning, be occupied not with your problems. Be occupied with His mercy. Be occupied that He is giving you new mercy for today. And one day at a time, your problems may be solved. He will take you out of it until you will be praising Him and thanking Him because His mercy conquered it all. 
and be built up and be encouraged and be in a church that's encouraging you. And it's important that you are that way. Mercy endures forever. Wow, I close with one last thought. Billy Graham tells a story. That's a great story. There's this man, Dr. Weigel, Harry Weigel, and he's almost 100 years old, and he was the director of the um, Tennessee Baptist Temple. And Dr. Weigel is almost 100 years old, and Billy Graham is called to do the dedication of this beautiful, big, big church and university. And he knows Dr. Weigel, so after the dedication is over, he goes to his apartment and he knocks, he's, he wants to go meet him. And he's about to knock on the door and he hears some shouting, some noise on the inside of the room. And he thinks to himself, that sounds like Dr. Weigel. What's he doing? So he puts his ear a little closer to the door and he hears these words, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! And he, and he just, this, this older man, 98 or 99 years old, is just praising the Lord and having a fantastic time praising the Lord. So he waits for a little while. And after many minutes, he knocks on the door. And this beautiful gentleman comes out, you know, almost 100 years old, can you imagine? But it's the glory of God is upon his face. And he's just being with like heaven, you know, community. And Billy Graham talks about it. He says, hey, I was listening from the dough, and you were, you were praying. What is that all about? And he says, I was just practicing for heaven. <laughs> hey, what a beautiful thing that is. What a beautiful thing. You know, we, we should do that too. You see, when we come to church, that's all we're doing. We're practicing for heaven. Don't ever say, oh, worship is not for me. The message is for me, but the praise and worship is not for me. When you go to heaven, there will be no more message. Jesus will be our message. But we will praise Him forever and ever and ever and ever. And learn to praise Him now. Because we'll be doing this occupation for thousands and thousands and millions of years in heaven. And learn to be a great praiser of God. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now we get to a moment, please, and we will give an invitation. Maybe there's somebody here this morning who is visiting our church. And maybe you would like to have the joy that we have, and we'd like to have the peace that we have. And before you can have the peace of God, you need to make peace with God. That happens through the cross. You need to recognize that you are a sinner. And you cannot save yourself. The Bible says nobody is good enough to go to heaven. But Jesus came from heaven. And He came to pay our price. And He died on the cross. And He shed His blood on the cross. And He paid your sins on the cross that anyone who believes in Him, He rose again. And anyone who believes in Him, only believe with all your heart that Jesus is Lord and Savior and you will be saved. And you can say a simple prayer, Lord Jesus, like this, Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Come into my life today to live. I receive You as my Lord and Savior. Change my life. Give me the Holy Spirit really in my life, powerfully leading me. And give me the joy that I see of others in this room and the joy of the Lord. So if you pray that prayer, God bless you. You can come and talk to me about it. And uh, we'll, we'll tell you what's the next step, how to, how to grow in your faith. And let's stand for a few minutes it's, uh, and worship the Lord. Okay.
what I have to do. He sent me to give the good news to the poor, tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more, tell blind people that they can see, and send the dumb witnesses throughout the world, the whole of the world. He sent me to give the good news to the poor, tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more, tell blind people that they can see, and set the dumb The news that the king